Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 19th meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask you all please to make sure that your mobile phones are on silent? The first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider taking item 7 and specific future items in private. Item 7 is the committee's approach to the pre-budget scrutiny and anticipated future items include the consideration of the committee's approach to the Transport Scotland Bill and the committee's approach on pre-budget scrutiny and options for post-legislative scrutiny. Are members agreed? agreed? We are agreed. We now move on to agenda item two, which is subordinate legislation. And this is an affirmative instrument that digital government uh, uh, bodies uh, as detailed on the agenda. The committee is going to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution and a motion seeking for the approval of the affirmative instrument will be considered at item three. Members should note that there has been no representations to the committee on this instrument. And I should say firstly that it seems unusual that this committee is considering this SSI given its subject matter. We are responsible for the digital infrastructure element of the digital strategy for which Mackay, Mr Mackay has overall responsibility, but not those specific items to which these SSI addresses. It seems that the remit of some of our subject committees are out of sync with ours, uh, with the portfolios and some portfolios of the members of the cabinet. That doesn't mean that I don't welcome you. Uh, Mr. Mackay, but before, but with, before I do, I would just like to ask members uh, if there are any declarations of interest before I go through that uh, and we deal with this section. Are there any declarations of interest? I don't know if it's a declaration of interest or not, but I am the PLO, which is something I have to admit to in the chamber. Thank you. So, uh, just since it's digital matters, I should say I'm a member of the Institution of Engineering and Technology and a member of the Association for Computing Machinery. Thank you. So, Mr Mackay, Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Constitution, I now do formally welcome you. I also welcome, uh, welcome Susan Brown, Head of Data Sharing and Access, and Graham Fisher, Head of Constitution and Civil Law. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a brief opening uh, statement? Okay, uh, thanks, Convener. And first of all, to give further clarity, my responsibility within government is for digital public services, and I suppose that's partly the uh, reason for my appearance and, and presentation uh, this morning, recognising that digital uh, is across portfolios uh, within um, Scottish government. Um, but that's the area in which uh, I lead. So I do welcome this opportunity to discuss the draft regulations, which uh, I respect are of a technical nature. Uh, they offer the potential uh, to improve the delivery of public services for the people of Scotland. And I'd like to start by setting them in context. Part five of the UK Digital Economy Act 2017 provides for the sharing of personal data between specified public bodies set out in Schedule 4 for the purposes of improving public service delivery. The regulations laid in the Scottish Parliament on the 17th of May add specified bodies to Schedule 4 to enable those bodies, where appropriate, to share personal information in order to improve public service delivery. I would like to highlight that the powers permit but do not compel data sharing Data protection law, which governs how personal data is processed and shared, continues to apply, of course. Both the Act and the regulations made under it together provide for data to be shared only by specified bodies and for tightly defined and specified objectives. And the objectives are being created in separate UK regulations, uh, the Digital Government Disclosure of Information Regulations 2018, laid in the Westminster Parliament also on the 17th of May, and which we have cited in full in the policy note. The Scottish regulations propose to add a limited number of bodies, specifically the Scottish Government, Scottish Local Authorities, Skills Development Scotland, and persons providing services to these bodies to share data for and only for the purposes of a specified objective. For the bodies being listed in these regulations, these include a multiple disadvantages objective, a television retuning objective, and a fuel poverty objective. 
These measures are supported by further safeguards, including an information sharing code of practice, which sets out the principles, processes and guidance for the use of and disclosure of information under these powers. Uh, the Scottish Ministers will expect public authorities and other participants in an information sharing arrangement to agree and adhere to the code before any information is shared. Failure to have regard to the code may result in public authorities losing the ability to disclose, receive and use information under the powers. We welcome the powers uh, that this UK-wide legislation brings and look forward to further <coughs> collaboration with the UK Government to ensure that the full potential of the legislation is realised in Scotland. I hope that this has been helpful and, of course, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The first uh, question will come from Stuart Stevenson. Much, Convener. I, I note at uh, paragraph 21 of uh, what's been provided to us uh, that one of the organisations with which there may be sharing is uh, Her Majesty's uh, Revenue and Customs. Um, given that this is clearly uh, an instrument related to UK legislation and that appears to be cross-border in scope, it would just be helpful if the Cabinet Secretary can confirm uh, that the intention is that the data sharing be uh, across uh, relevant bodies in all the governments that are affected by this. Um, well, well, yes, obviously I'm only interested, or specifically interested in the, the Scotland-UK relationship. There's a crossover between reserve function and devolved function. If it was just devolved, we could legislate a, a bring regulations to Parliament for our own interest, but clearly there's a joint working with UK government where there's reserve functions, as is the case with HMRC, and therefore, yes, the, the, the interrelationship with devolved administrations in UK government and all public bodies related to that would be expected to cooperate, as I say, but this is, this is not compulsion, this is permission. Thank you. Stuart Richard. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. In the past, we, we generally had different agencies didn't know um, people's information and uh, there was a lot of problems. So I welcome the fact there's going to be information sharing. But when there is information sharing, are the public, is the public, is the individual able to ask each and every agency that has their information what they hold on them? This in a, no way a, interferes with changes or amend anyone's individual rights to seek that information. This is to, within all the safeguards that we have now in relation to data sharing and information and data protection, within that allowing specified bodies for a specified purpose to be able to share that very particular information for a good reason and all the usual checks and balances are there indeed the information uh, commissioner has been consulted upon those proposed very specific uh, regulations and actions as well but yes it no way impedes individuals rights to seek that information um, john uh, thanks convener um i mean i welcome the fact that uh, it is you know there's a lot of privacy and that's uh, considered to be very important and what other members have just asked as well. I mean, from my experience in other committees, uh, on the, previously on the Finance Committee, currently in the Economy Committee, a big problem has been trying to get data out of UK agencies like HMRC uh, that we have not, we, SNFC, uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission and others have not been able to get data out of these. Is, uh, are you anticipating that this is going to make it easier for Scottish government, Scottish uh, public bodies, to get hold of UK information which would be helpful to us in a whole range of areas? Because you also said they would only permit them, so will they not be required to give us the information that we need? It's not a compulsion. Um, so two points, convener. First of all, what I'm bringing to committee is that affirmative procedure to permit those bodies to be able to share information. That's what I'm seeking committee approval so to do, and ultimately Parliament. There is then a separate question around how far the agencies named go to use those powers. Now, these are areas that I think as parliamentarians we may well wish to encourage, such as bodies being able to share information to tackle campaigns, for example, to target multiple deprivation. So I think there's good cause for a, these regulations to be brought forward. I would expect, because of the good principle behind them, that agencies would participate um, 
it's providing a gateway, essentially. That, that's my role here, to provide that gateway, to, to open the door to appropriately, carefully, and within all the privacy checks and safeguards that have been outlined in the documentation that you have, to have that uh, permission to exchange information. Because it's a good thing that people's data has been tightened up and it just can't be used willy-nilly across even the public sector, even when there's good cause. So it's very specific, very specific to the bodies, the conditions, the safeguards, and the objective. But within that, Mr. Mason, of course, I would like to think that if there's good cause, that agencies will participate within that. And as I say, that we've clearly outlined the purpose. And whether it's multiple deprivation or another really good example that I'm sure members would ask me in a with a different hat on, how do we target young people that are not in education, employment or training? Uh, and right now we run campaigns and we, you know, various agencies will do their best to try and target those people. But if we can actually have, a, have the data on which young people are most excluded, then it gives us a way, and our agencies, appropriate agencies, such as Skills Development Scotland, as is proposed, a way to contact them using that data. So I can't see how people would, 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 would wish to object to that, but of course, it's essentially, I'm putting that in the context of expecting agencies to comply um, with the kind of principles that public bodies would, would be pursuing there. If it, are, if, if it becomes an issue that there's a lack of participation and I'm aware of it, I'll certainly erase that as appropriate which is the essence of the question, but that goes beyond what I'm seeking committee to do today. But of course we'd want to be proactive if that data has not been shared in a fashion that meets the policy objectives that I think we would all agree upon. Of course, at least two members of this committee have a very specific request around HMRC and the matter of income tax returns that I should not delve any further into, convener, but it is an example that has been appropriately raised by Mr Stevenson since he's pointing to himself, I'm not exposing him here, eh, as to data sharing and seeking assurances that bodies are sharing the information that should be shared appropriately with Scottish Government, but that's a whole separate subject and not one of the specified functions that I'm asking you to approve today, in fairness. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jamie, I think you're the next question. Thank you, Gavino. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, two quick questions. The first one is around the, the seven-week consultation that you ran. Could you share with the committee any feedback, both positive or negative, uh, on your uh, proposals and how you addressed any uh, uh, feedback that you were given. And the second one is just turning to the policy objective, uh, uh, apology, uh, section 19, where it talks about TV retuning objective. It states that Scottish local authorities are listed against the TV retuning objective in order that they may share data with the DWP and the Secretary of State for Defence. Do you have any idea of what that means or what the practical implication of that may be? Because it's quite hard to actually work out the consequence of that. Uh, convener, I, th I think they're both very fair questions. So, first of all, on consultation, uh, there was an appropriate consultation um, a exercise. Um, th there was no great objection. And one area that I would want to draw attention to is the uh, Information Commissioner was satisfied with these proposals. So, I think that that's quite important and quite potent. Um, I'll ask officials to clarify if there were any changes in light of the consultation, but essentially the level of return was, was not such that would give me any cause for concern. I'll also um, ask for officials to cover the TV retuning issue because, frankly, when I look at the list of priorities and profile, um, some clearly we, we have greater importance to the Scottish Government right now, such as targeting those and not in positive education, employment or training or tackling multiple deprivation. So those are the two very specific ones. Um, I did pose the same questions, and why are we having to do something on uh, retuning? It, to which the answer was that it's essentially preparing for, should the UK government, and, and in that matter, change that we are in an advanced position to be able to share information in the way that, that they would want to if there's assistance required in that regard. But I think the more substantial um, powers here are around our functions are around the tackling a uh, deprivation and a uh, in terms of uh, young people not in those um are more exposed to, to worklessness worklessness um, uh, and so on but there were no major concerns from the consultation convener if i may officials can add to that if cabinet secretary whoever you'd like to bring in to clarify that okay, I can or okay both. If, 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 if. 
Um, to confirm in relation to the consultation, four responses were received, two from individuals, one from the Information Commissioner's Office and another from the Welsh Government. In terms of specific feedback, ICO called for the need to explain the nature of data sharing that would be permitted and to be specific when describing particular instances, instances of data sharing to support public service delivery. In response, a privacy impact assessment has been carried out and that's been issued and should be part of your committee papers. And um, specific, share, specific sharing in the future would be subject to further privacy impact assessments. So to be clear, there was no suggestion that we needed to change what we were asking for, just that the necessary assessments were undertaken. That's been done yes. and that's been provided to the committee and should be in your pack. Cabinet Secretary, do, do, you, do you want to ask Graham to come in or has, has Susie answered all the I questions? I think that's covered all. Thank okay. Um, Jamie, if, if, are you content with that? Okay, Stuart Stevenson. Um, I, I just wonder if officials perhaps could confirm that the HMRC's uh, role in retuning TVs is because they know who are the people who have free TV licences and it's an attempt by the local councils to support these people as part of the migration from analogue TV to digital TV, uh, where there has been, particularly in the early days, quite a lot of frequency changes that uh, some of our older uh, citizens have not found easy to cause their equipment to retune. And I, I, it would be helpful if somebody could confirm my suspicion that that's actually what it's about. If you, if you don't know the specific answer to that, I'm very happy that you, you could write to the committee yeah. and confirm afterwards. As I said earlier, I'll write and give you the detail of that because some of what we are doing is simply including the devolved bodies within the framework of policy where it interacts with reserved functions of which, of course, broadcasting and HMRC are reserved. So if you wish further information on that very specific issue, which may not come as a surprise to me, then I'll provide that to the committee. Um, to me, neither. Um, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for offering that. Does anyone else have any questions? Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a uh, closing uh, statement in relation to that? O only insofar as to say that all the necessary checks and balances are in place. I think we're in a very strong policy environment in relation to data and data sharing, but there are sound objectives behind us, and I think these regulations help us uh, progress with that in the fashion that's been agreed with the UK Government and with uh, legislation in both Westminster and the Scottish Parliament, and happy to proceed. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We're therefore going to move on to Agenda Item 3. This is the formal consideration of Motion uh, S5M12602, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, asking the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee to recommend that the Digital Government open bracket, Scottish Body close brackets Regulations 2018 be approved. Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to move that motion and to make any further comments you would care to make? I move and no further comments. Okay, do any members of the committee have any comments? Okay, therefore the question is that motion S5M12602 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. I therefore would like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for attending the meeting today. And I'm going to briefly suspend the meeting to allow the panel to depart and a changeover of witnesses. No more than five minutes, uh, committee members. Thank you. The meeting is suspended.
Good morning again to everyone. Uh, we're now going to move to agenda item four, which is Glasgow Presswick Airport. Uh, before I do so, I'd like to ask if there's any members who would like to declare an interest in relation to the airport. Stuart. Uh, it's, it's in relation potentially to military flights. I'm a, a Northern Area Committee member of the Highland Reserve Forces and Cadets Association, uh, which has an interest in uh, uh, the RAF. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to welcome John Scott, MSP, to this meeting um, as, as it falls within his constituency. Uh, this is an update on Glasgow Presswick Airport and its financial management. In advance of the evidence session, several members of the committee, including myself, attended a tour of the airport's operational facilities on the 4th of June 2018, for which we were extremely grateful for the opportunity to do so. I'd like to welcome from Glasgow Presswick Airport Andrew Miller, the non-executive chairman, Stuart Adams, the chief executive office officer, and Ian Forgey, the Director of Finance. Uh, Andrew, would you like to make a brief opening statement uh, up to five minutes? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you say on my right, Stuart Adams, apart from being the interim chief executive, Stuart joins us, joined us in October, and he has a very impressive uh, aviation background and experience. Most recently, as managing director of Logan Air, and prior to that, in Tiger Airways in Singapore, so very well qualified to sit on my right hand side and on my left, Ian, one of Ian's great uh, strengths is the fact he used to work at the airport in the late 90s, early 2000s and rejoined us uh, to play, play part in the, the, the team. I welcome the opportunity uh, and since the last time that I actually um, uh, appeared here to update the committee. Uh, but I would like to thank the committee members who came to Presswick for their two, three hour visit uh, some two weeks ago, which I hope gave them a greater understanding of uh, what's happening uh, on site uh, with the enterprise. I can assure the, the committee that our investment in the business is being matched with a relentless pursuit, uh, not only of new business, but in uh, committing to achieving uh, maximum efficiencies in terms of the investment, in terms of the reduction in the operating loss. In the financial year 2017 to 2018, we handled 702,000 passengers, which was an increase of 3.5% on the previous year. And we continue to press hard for new customers. Uh, last year, we approached 23 individual airlines over a long period of time during the 12 months, and the work continues to, with the team to attract more and more business into the Presswick uh, area. And uh, from a cargo point of view, uh, we had 17 meetings with cargo airlines in the last 12 months. The prolonged uncertainty over Brexit and the full impact on aviation is uh, still disrupting air passenger travel in the UK along with uh, investments. At the same time, where there is a, an ongoing pre process within the aviation industry of consolidation and uh, that has major implications for the pattern of airline bases and the location of the key personnel, but also a consequent impact in terms of uh, the airport's uh, infrastructure around the UK. The added challenge to uh, Brexit is the frustrations over the delays and the introduction of air, the reduction of air passenger duty, which was scheduled to be around the 50% level, uh, gradually going to zero uh, over a four-year term, which clearly hasn't happened, and the committee be aware of the reasons why that didn't happen. Our increase in total gross revenues from 13.6 million in the year 2016 to 17 uh, to an anticipated 18.2 million in 2017-18 uh, is quite substantial. However, that last number is unaudited and we're yet to prepare the year-end accounts and place them before the Minister, who will place them uh, before Parliament towards the end of this year. Freight traffic and military flights, private aviation, engineering and service activity continue to develop and show robust signs of growth and uh, a consequent increase in revenues and will do uh, in the future years of the business. Uh, we've added, as Mr. John Scott knows, we've added Chevron to our 
engineering mix on the airport, who employed nearly, nearly 50 people, which is a new business and new enterprise that we managed to uh, seduce into the, uh, our enterprise, and they're performing very well. Additional to that, we've uh, secured the services of three new non-exec directors whose background and experience is quite significant, not only in terms of independence of their experience, but their background and experience in aviation and, uh, on, a global, and on a global basis. Despite the challenging operating budgets that we've had, uh, we have very little outsourcing of services. We're a fully integrated business and we provide services uh, to all our enterprises without uh, or outsourcing. And we work within an area which employs 4,000 uh, people. Despite the challenging operating budgets and very little outsourcing of services, we're committed to paying the Scottish living wage and we're in negotiation with the trade unions on how we move this forward to achieve our 2020 commitments. I would like to thank the committee for the time today in terms of uh, you know, our opportunities, but um, you know, there will be some questions, I'm sure, about why the market environment has changed. One particular example I would give is fuel, since I've been the non-executive chair at Presswick Airport, has hit a low of $45 a barrel uh, to a high of $80 US a barrel. And, and when you consider that uh, fuel costs and aviation on airlines can be between 50 to 65% of their operating costs. That's a significant impact on the bottom line. And we have to be cognizant of that because the DNA of airports is a reflection of the DNA of the airline customers that fly into the airports. And we have to be cognizant of their issues driving the business. It's a brief overview in terms of introduction, but it gives you a balanced balance sense of the challenges and the opportunities that are presented uh, to management. Despite uh, the shadow of the factors that I've highlighted, uh, which cover the whole of the aviation sector, I firmly believe that Presswick Airport can have a sustainable future as a distinctive, multifaceted aviation centre, and that such a centre can be a major benefit to not only Ayrshire, but also to the Scottish economy. Thank you. Andrew, we, there are a series of questions I'm sure that we'll have during this morning. If I could just remind you to catch my eye if you want to answer them. If, if, if none of you catch my eye, I'll, I will catch one of your eyes. And I would just ask, when you're answering the question, if you could just keep looking at me, it just helps me then to make sure I can bring the next person in at the right moment. So the first question is from Richard Lyle. Richard. Yes, good morning, gentlemen. Can I say, uh, like the convener, I certainly enjoyed my visit on the 4th of June. I'm certainly impressed with your new board, but as I have, and I'm pre as I've previously said, I am a supporter of your airport. But like others, I'd like to know why is it air tra transport movements down, passenger numbers down, freight handling down at Presswick Airport, uh, and they've effectively remained static over the last few years, while nearby competitors have seen significant increases. In fact, you know, basically, we need to know why is this and what action are you taking to reverse this? Who'd like to head off on that? Stuart. Thank you. Uh, I think in terms of the numbers, the passenger numbers do show very small growth over 17, 18, over 16, 17, it's about 3.5%. We're not deluding ourselves. It's, that is not a number to be proud of. In terms of freight tonnage, we're actually up about 3.5% as well. So there's more just growth in both areas, uh, but there's much room for improvement. When I came into the business only seven, eight months ago, I reviewed the target list of the airline customers with my knowledge uh, and background. Uh, we changed the approach. We tried to do higher level approaches to the chief executive levels of various airlines to understand the issues they've, they've got. But I think our main challenge at the moment is that although the airline industry is, is booming and capacity is growing, the number of operators there is reducing. And as Andrew touched on earlier, over 12 months we've approached 23 separate airlines about passenger flying. Uh, some have shown some interest. We had a great deal of interest from a Cypriot operator who uh, we put a package together for them we're very happy with. The commercials all stacked up. 
but there was an operational issue uh, with the pilots that meant they could not operate this summer, which was very disappointing, so we're trying to get them back next summer. So my impression is I joined the business. I had no history of the business. I was an airline man through and through, and I walked in on day one with no uh, preconceptions whatsoever. And the thing that I was impressed with was the level of uh, ability within the business, the actual infrastructure of the business, although it's tired in some places, is, it was in far better condition than I thought it would be in. Uh, so if I were an airline being brought to Prestwick, uh, is there anything there that puts me off flying from the, uh, the passenger point of view? No. Uh, but it's a very, very difficult environment at the moment, given the strength at, at Edinburgh and Glasgow. And a lot of the bigger uh, carriers now easy jets and, 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 and the like are reasonably settled at these places and they've shown no inclination to expand or, or take some of that operation uh, to Prestwick rather than in Glasgow or Edinburgh or anywhere else for that matter. So it is hard work. Uh, we constantly, we have a business development team that constantly work on this. Uh, so the passenger and cargo side, small growth, the encouraging thing from my point of view, the other revenue sources within the business are all showing signs of increase. Uh, we have an extensive property portfolio and we've gone from about 50% occupancy to 90% occupancy. Uh, some of the other areas are, are growing significantly. The, the fuel supply that we provide to private customers is, is on the increase as well. So there are success stories within the overall numbers, but yeah, passenger numbers certainly need to increase, but it, it is very difficult at the moment. At the meeting, when we, we were there, that um, you won't see an increase in passenger numbers. And I, I take on board the, the fact that the airport airlines, but <coughs> I attend <coughs> cross-party groups for uh, airports, and, and they're all saying, we need more slots, we need more slots. You've got loads of slots. I've been in your airport at 11 o'clock at night, and I was the only person there, apart from the staff, waiting for my daughter coming back from Barcelona. So basically, you've answered in some ways my second question, but what are the barriers to Glasgow Airport att attracting new airline customers? What needs to be done to overcome come them? You know, is there a fact that you can offer um, better service, lesser landing fees? You, know, you tell me very attractive commercial package in place that I inherited from the previous uh, board, which is as good as I've ever seen in my time in the aviation industry. So commercially, there is, we are as attractive as any other airport in the UK. So it's not as if we're sat there with a very high tariff that's putting potential customers off, far from it. Besides which, we offer, we work in, in partnership with South Asia Council, for instance, who sit at various meetings with us and airline customers asking how they can help. So we're trying to uh, create packages that go out with the normal packages an airline would expect to see from an airport. But at the moment, uh, most of these airlines seem to be entirely settled with the operation that they've got at other airports. They make money there. There's a risk to them to try and move some of that. They could cannibalise some of their existing Scottish activity. So, yeah, I can understand that fully. Uh, so we now need to adjust our thinking. There's a lot of uh, increase in the low-cost uh, model in the Eastern Europe. So we're, we're now trying to attract some of the Eastern European low-cost carriers by direct contact with high-level executives. But it is difficult. Okay. John, you've got the next question. Yes, thanks. Um, probably to follow on from uh, Richard Lyle's line of questioning. I mean, uh, specifically a link to London is, I, has been reported as being quite important. Uh, I mean, is that specific a possibility? Is that something you're looking at? Is it important? As far as I'm concerned, again, with my background, I feel we can sustain a London service. I think a London service is vital. We've got the catchment around the airport that could justify it. But again, it's, if you look at the sheer quantity of flights between, you know, for instance, Glasgow and London, uh, it's very, very difficult. But we have approached fairly recently a, a number of carriers with a package to try and attract uh, a London service. But again, there's no point having one service a day. You need multiple frequencies for the business travel. You need three or four 
per day, uh, and that's that's a fair degree of commitment from a from an operator. But it's work in progress. I certainly think the airport uh, can justify a London service. Just uh, adding to that point, uh, if I may, the um, there was a conference last week in Olympia. Uh, Irish UK aviation conference and two carriers, uh, Flybe and EasyJet, both had Presswick Heathrow on their long term development plans, which is part and parcel of the Heathrow hub project and how we are actually involved in that sort of process. So there's guaranteed access uh, for Scotland by way of slots at Heathrow, and we know the airlines have got ourselves penciled in in terms of uh, the future. But that's a fairly slow burn project, but we're actually working on it. Okay, I, I mean, if passengers are the real challenge, and you seem to be making progress in other areas, like uh, selling fuel to the military and other issues, what would the position of the airport be if you just dropped passengers altogether and only did freight, military and so on? Would that make it more profitable, less profitable, do you know? We're in the middle, well, we're not in the middle, we've just started a major exercise that we're reviewing all the, the uh, revenue sources within the, the organisation and allocating uh, fixed costs against them to fully get a better understanding of what areas of the business perform, and I've no doubt some of them do perform reasonably well, and which ones are a real drain on the resource. So that, that is work in progress at the moment, and the cost of the passenger operation will be identified as part of that. You can't say right now if the, if the passenger bit is making a profit or a loss. I think I, I said to committee members when, we, when the visit took place that as far yeah, I, it's clear to me the passenger side of the business does not make money. Sorry, can I just clarify? Uh, it's, 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 uh, and you were very open and very helpful on the visit that it's quite helpful to, to assume that the information that you gave at the visit hasn't all come back here. So if you could make sure that you repeat that information for the record as well. Uh, because we didn't keep a record of it. I, ne I do remember that conversation, but it'd be helpful for other committee members. John, do you want to come back? Just, one other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, just to switch on to freight then, if I may. Um, would, if you're trying to grow freight, does that mean that the existing operators get a bit bigger, or do you have to bring in a new operator on freight who would actually kind of use Prestwick as a base? Uh, can you explain maybe how that works? Ideally, you'd like both. Uh, we're seeing significant growth from our cargo lux operation at the moment because although they haven't increased frequencies, they uh, cancelled a service that they had gone to Stansted. So a lot of the Stansted cargo actually makes its way up to Prestwick and, and departs on their, their aircraft from Prestwick. So the tonnage, which is where we make our money, uh, is in the increase on existing movements, if you like. But, we have employed uh, a well-known cargo industry expert who lives 10 minutes from the airport, he's retired, and he's managed to open certain doors within the cargo industry. It's a, it's a very niche market, and yeah, certain doors have been opened to us now, and discussions taking place where we can discuss the capabilities at Prestwick, which are fairly unique, certainly within Scotland. Uh, we can we can handle the largest aircraft that anybody can throw at us and very, very specialist loads. I'm extremely impressed about the cargo capabilities, but it, it's getting the message out there that we're here, we're open for business and we're, yeah, we're very capable. Go down, you could actually unload and get the freight off a plane much quicker than they could, say, at Stansted? Yeah, in terms of some of the, it's clear from some of the discussions, uh, there's frustration at some of these airports about the length of time the freight takes to clear customs, for instance. We can clear customs very, very quickly. So the cargo lux aircraft comes in, it's offloaded, and the lorries are loaded instantly and depart yeah, within an hour. Uh, it's clear there are some frustrations there, and we must obviously sell the benefits that we've got in terms of an easy transition. That's great, thanks. Just so there are some other questions. I, I, I'd just like to ask a question. When we were down at the airport, uh, what, what impressed me was the closeness of the railway connection. Uh, and the fact that you are bringing your fuel in, I think, by railway line rather than by pipe. It seems to me that with this great freight capacity that you talk about, that one of the simple uh, additions which would make you stand above other airports is a, is a connection to get rail freight into your airport. Do you, do you agree that that would be a significant uh, advantage? Is it significant? Uh, 
significant advantage, you say, Mr. Chair, in terms of uh, the, 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 the opportunity. Uh, the connectivity from freight from rail to the airport is not 100% connected, but as part of our uh, Heathrow hub project, uh, it was rail, but also sea were part of the, that bid in terms of uh, connecting all the, the dots up to make sure that uh, we could ship prefabricated pieces to uh, the, the third runway down at, uh, down at Heathrow, so it was significant. The security supply is a good thing. The other good thing is nearly, well, slightly less than a third of our passengers use the rail connection to come to the airport, which is, has environmental considerations. Uh, we're the only airport in Scotland that you can achieve that, uh, which is absolutely fine. And also, as you say, the security of supply from a fueling perspective in terms of direct shipments from uh, the East Coast, from Grangemouth, uh, really, really important. The connectivity from a freight perspective uh, is an embryonic uh, issue in terms of getting the, 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 the correct and proper connections, but it's part and parcel of the, uh, the new runway at, uh, in London at Heathrow. Okay. Jamie, Pete, and then Peter. Both <coughs> questions. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, can I revert to the previous line of questioning around the costs of the passenger operation? Uh, it's fair to say that Presswick Airport has, has been receiving quite a substantial amount of loan funding from the public purse for nearly five years now. Uh, how is it the case that at this point in time, no one to date has done any analysis on the cost of running the passenger operation? Uh, how do we get to a place where that work has only just started? And if, after doing this piece of work, your suspicions ring true that this is a loss-making part of the business, would you recommend to the Strategic Board the cessation of that element of Presswick Airport? Can, can I ask when you're answering that question to stick to the, to the uh, examination of the uh, viability of the passenger numbers, because the loan funding is going to come later and... and uh, there may be some dissent from other members of the committee, so if you could <laughs> uh, stick to the viability of passengers and how you're going to report that. Okay, well, I, I can't really comment and say too much about you know, the processes and what was done before my, my time at the airport. There are uh, management accounts, there are indicators there, so we're not entirely without uh, information on this, but I need a far more detailed assessment of the true cost, not only of the obvious costs, the staff costs, the infrastructure costs, but the overhead costs as well. So I, we've decided that as part of a, an overall review of the whole business, again, we should re-examine that. I've got various numbers now that I've, I've been provided with that I'm going to retest because it was some time ago since it was last done. But it's key we understand how each part of the business is. It's a multifaceted business. There are numerous revenue sources. We need to understand what all the costs are associated with each of these. Now, obviously, we've got those at the moment, but I'm, I'm, I'm having those rechecked at the moment. Uh, Neither of my questions have been answered, if I could. Well, you can push, push on the passenger numbers, but uh, not on the loan. loan it's, not, it's not about the finances. It's my, my question was, uh, and Mr. Miller has been around much longer than yourself, Mr. Adams, is uh, why no one has done this piece of work to date? The question wasn't answered. My second question was, if the numbers are true, that the passenger part of the business is indeed a loss-making business, would it be the strategic board's view that they suggest that part of the business stops and focuses on the more profitable sides of the business? And that was my question. Um, I'll answer that uh, because I have been around. I've been here for over uh, three years. What surprised me when I came into the business was, for instance, just an energy cost. The mapping of our total energy bill uh, was not mapped to the lines of activity of the business. It, the electricity bill wasn't mapped, for instance, to the terminal facilities or the assets of the business. And uh, we had to do a mapping. Just on that one thing, we had to install meters around the plant uh, to get subsets of the total picture to build up lines of activity in the business, lines of revenue, lines of cost, and map that to the balance sheet in terms of the assets to get a better understanding of where the costs lay. There was more of an aggregated approach to the, uh, to the, to the business. Now, I will tell you, just on pure electricity supply, there were some surprises uh, you know, that came 
it came out of that exercise. And that's just one element, probably about uh, 50 to 70 elements of cost that were actually wrestling to ground. And, uh, you know, my dear learned friend here on the left, uh, our financial whiz, uh, is helping us with that uh, particular exercise. Want to say something? Yes, yeah, so just to clarify, I've only been in the business for six weeks. Eight. So, oh, eight weeks now. <laughs> it probably feels like six months, yes. I was here, I was there in the business in the year 2000, so it's 17 years ago with a very different uh, framework. But uh, as Andrew says, coming into fresh in the business exactly, uh, as the committee member has said, uh, I want to really understand what's going on in the business streams of, of the business, and, and it's not clear for me on the outside. So it's early days, and that's the work that we're undertaking now to really, really understand the business streams and see what the profitability is or the loss-making side of the business to make a recommendation to the shareholder later this year. Yeah. Ian, can I just ask, were you surprised that information wasn't available when you arrived there? Um, well, it's only six weeks, so I'm having to get up to speed. It's not in the format that I would be used to, and it's certainly not as clear as I would be used to in running the business and the experience that I've had. Uh, I would expect the board to have better information to be able to run the business. Okay, thank you. Um, Peter, and then Stuart. Yes, gentlemen, I, you're looking for new opportunities for freight. You want to grow freight. And I, I have a suggestion that, you, and maybe you've looked at it, maybe you haven't, but we, uh, one of our great success stories is food and drink in Scotland, and we export thousands of tonnes of farmed salmon uh, every year to the USA. Now, as you well know, it's produced in the northwest of Scotland. It'll, it goes in a lorry from there down to Heathrow, as I understand it. The vast bulk of that uh, fish is exported via Heathrow having passed your airport on the way south. Is there an opportunity for you to get involved in that marketplace? Because, there, you know, it is a significant amount of, uh, of freight that is uh, shipped annually to uh, the USA. Who would like to... Uh, Andrew. Uh, I've got the most experience in this, Rivera. You are you're correct in proper. There, there is substantial movements uh, between, uh, I would call it, fresh uh, seafood, uh, which tends to go by road, which tends to be in marine tanks, uh, which is live. The consolidation point is a place called Lark Hall, uh, very near Mr. Uh, Mr. Lyle's uh, constituency. And uh, there's about 30 to 35 trucks a day go there. Now, uh, brine seawater tends to be incompatible with, uh, with, with freighter services because of the, the salt water and uh, corrosion. In terms of the uh, Smoked salmon, etc. You're absolutely right. It's a substantial market, not only to the United States but also to Asia. The situations are consistency of supply in terms of 365 days, consistency of quality, which I'm not saying the Scottish market doesn't provide, but there are multiple providers in terms of uh, not only our region in Scotland but but elsewhere that consolidate that process to provide that consistency of supply. Now we have approached some of the players. Uh, I've even been to Gia, to the Halibut production plant there, and, uh, which was a fascinating facility. And we've had discussions with some of the producers, even sort of right wing, it, sorry, left, you know, brain thinking. Um, I said, how can we improve our chances? And they say, put a smoking house at the end of the runway, because that is when we know between fresh and, and preserved, because the, consult, the, the, the market producers are very diverse, they consolidate, but it's a good opportunity to make the switch uh, in a consolidated way. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a silly question. Uh, we've had dialogue with the CEO of food and drinks industry, we've had dialogue with some of the, um, some of the freight carriers, etc. And uh, a lot of the stuff, the drink uh, goes, by, goes by sea, of course, and some of the preserved fish products go by sea as well. Um, so it's about how we actually attack that. Stuart. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I want to just uh, explore with the, the panel uh, possible uh, ways of expanding the business and developing the business. And in particular, if we can identify uh, whether there are constraints that might be for others, including government, to address, because if we can identify those, then we can go and do something about it. So, just picking up one or two things that have come up. Uh, we talked about the prospects for rail freight coming in. Uh, are, are we aware whether there are gauging issues on the rail network that inhibit the deliver of, delivery of containers? Because I know a lot of Scotland's rail network 
is difficult for a lot of freight. And if that's the case, have discussions taken place with Network Rail about uh, re-gauging? I have a number of questions, but I'll just take them simply one by one. So that technical question. I do know that the uh, the rail yards where they are, some most of them are actually redundant, uh, you know, in uh, Mr. Scott's area. Uh, but it was part and parcel of the uh, multimodal hub uh, proposition to Heathrow. The, the major opportunities for the business going forward uh, beyond freight are to do with the spaceport uh, uh, situation and also the, the Heathrow hub, which we're actively uh, working on. The issue in terms of the Scottish supply uh, issue in terms of being at railheads to bring in consolidated press because the biggest issue that we have. Multiple suppliers having to consolidate and I'll be honest with you in terms of freight access to the very northern parts of our dear country is somewhat limited and, um, and fragmented and um, you know uh, that, that is an issue. Well, we've got W11 and W9 gauging up to Inverness nowadays. But however, that's, I, I'll leave that one with you. And okay. It, let me just move on to one or two others because I don't want to make a meal out of something that's not going to be digestible. Um, you, 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 um, you, the one thing I haven't heard uh, in any discussion is whether you've been discussing with tour operators because clearly tour operators, the majority uh, of uh, tours are now air tours, but equally, um, you're relatively adjacent to Guruk, um, where there are now very large, among the world's largest uh, cruise liners coming in, and clearly a lot of cruising is intermodal, particularly to aviation. And I just wonder if you've been talking to tour operators um, in general terms about uh, flights, but also in particular to uh, the, 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 the cruise industry. And I, I say that my very first flight out of uh, uh, Prestwick was 1972, was a Sovscot tour on an Aeroflot charter, uh, which was a Scottish firm using foreign. And, and, and that relates to perhaps your discussions with Eastern European Airlines, of course. Interestingly enough, uh, the Cypriot airline, who we got f quite far advanced with, we involved local travel agents and tour companies to try and encourage them to come to Prestwick. And to be honest, the response was very, very good. Uh, they thought there was a good demand for seat-only market. A lot of Scottish people have accommodation, our own houses or whatever, in Cyprus. Uh, and they were trying to push Prestwick as a, as a seat only uh, option rather than Glasgow, I think, as more packages, the operators in Glasgow sell packages rather than seat only. So we work very closely with them and as far as direct approaches to uh, that, that type of traffic, no, but it is on a list to be honest. And we are in the process at the moment that we are bolstering the commercial team with a new commercial director who will be in post probably within the next month. And that's certainly on a list of things that yeah, we'll be asking them to explore. What about cruise liners? So, I mean, some of the cruise liners are carrying two and a half thousand passengers. And clearly, if that's the starting point or the ending point of lots of people's cruises, if you can get a couple of hundred of these on a plane back to the States, and you know, to, I, I'm not trying to tell you to do your business because I can't do that, but I do want to be sure that you're pursuing all the avenues. And that's another one because the, 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 the surface travel between somewhere like Gurek and Presswick is both predictable and pretty stress-free compared to some other alternatives. You're absolutely right. Um, and uh, a lot of changes have, ha have happened so, since the 1970s. I remember them very well. I, uh, I used to work for British Airways and I was in the last direct flight from New York to, uh, uh, to Glasgow Pressway Airport in the, the early 80s. There has been a change in uh, the distribution and the product uh, additions uh, to, the, to the market. Uh, distribution has changed via the internet, but the specific market you're talking about uh, is derived around inbound traffic uh, inbound international traffic. Uh, there is a growth in the cruise market, undeniably. 
there is an accelerator effect because of the reduction in the value of the pound uh, against the key currencies for that inbound market, which is providing a short-term stimulation. And you can see that between the difference between Glasgow and Edinburgh in terms of the current performance just now. And uh, we have no substantial inbound market into Presswick. Uh, it's sun sea and sand outbound, and the balance is a very small percentage inbound. We currently have no access to long-haul international services. We have been dealing with some of the companies. I don't want to mention their names, but there's been a migration uh, from uh, the low-cost short-haul model to the low-cost longer-haul model. And uh, there are four or five airlines playing in that space. And there's um, uh, the development of some of the companies, like IAG, for instance, uh, with this company called Level, uh, where they've taken a bit of a uh, sharp intake of breath in regards to changing that model to low-cost long-haul because of the current situation with the biggest player in this market who have some balance sheet uh, issues in terms of uh, strength just now. Brief question, um, the, You're particularly well-placed for long-haul because of the size of your runway and your excellent weather conditions, and you're already dealing with a lot of long-haul in relation to cargo, particularly ad hoc uh, cargo. Uh, so is that a marketing advantage in trying to see if you can develop some of the charter long haul uh, to come in in the first instance, which would then create an environment where um, scheduled carriers might view the opportunity on the back of traffic built and charter? That, that, that's very true. You're absolutely true. And it's in the DNA of Glasgow Presswick Airport since the very beginning of time when they became an airport. It was a, by government policy, by instruct, uh, by part of the bilaterals. If you wanted to fly internationally, you had to do it out of uh, Glasgow Presswick Airport. The market has changed, lengthening of runways, other uh, airports developing. The deregulation of that process has driven uh, a lot of the volume and activity to, to other airports. Um, that was a balance between inbound and outbound. We don't have these bilaterals to help us control the business, but you're absolutely right. There are, they are on uh, our agenda. We have spoken to some of the uh, longer haul uh, airlines as part of the mix of the 27 to try and encourage them. And it is true that inbound traffic, especially from Asia, is not sensitive to distance between the airport and you probably know some of the ma major tour groups uh, down in the, the southeast of London. You know, they think they're in the centre of London and they're in Acton Town, uh, you know, in hotels round about there or in Streatham, and they think they're in the centre of the business. So you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a great observation and one of which we're actually working with, uh, with the carriers involved. Uh, the next question is Mike Rumbles. Thank you very much, Convener. I want to talk about finance. Um, According to the annual account, your annual account submitted to Companies House, you've made an operating loss every year for the last nine years. You've made an operating loss of £24 million in the four, last four years that you've submitted accounts, coinciding with the time the Scottish Government bought the company for a pound. Um, that has hardly changed from the previous four years when you made an operating loss of £25 million. You've now received a total, as I understand it, of £40 million of loans from the Scottish Government as the shareholder. Um, it strikes me, my question was going to be, um, when will the Scottish taxpayer get our money back? But it strikes me that, the Scot it looks like to me, that the Scottish taxpayer will never get their money back from this investment at your airport, wouldn't you agree? Um, yeah. Like after eight weeks, you're answering that question. <laughs> well, he's got the numbers, but I can talk in general. Yeah, your, the numbers. your numbers are, uh, is what I was, ex uh, my analysis of so far in the last uh, three or four years, the business is exactly the same since the, the, the business was acquired by the government, that, um, and that roughly equates to 38 million pounds of investment in the business. Um, but you're right, going forward, it's, you know, wh when are we going to get a position to be able to repay that cash? So we need to first return the business to profitable position, which I think has always been the strategic plan. Um, but as I said, uh, coming new to the business, uh, we need to analyse it better to understand where the profitable parts of the business are, 
and the loss making parts of the business and make a decision as to what do we do next within the business. So that's what we're taking together for the board. I mean, I, I, I don't think you're going to be able to do this, but I mean, I could forlornly ask whether what year do you think the Scottish taxpayer might ever get their money back? I can't answer that right, question. Right, okay. I mean, I want to focus on the four years before the Scottish Government took over the company, and you made an operating loss of £25 million. Since then, you've taken a £4.5 million loan in the first year, £6 million in the second, £10 million in the third, £9.6 million in the fourth, and £9.4 million last year. You've now, in that same four-year period, still made the same operating loss. And I haven't heard anything so far today that gives me any confidence that this company is going to be in any position at any time to make a profit. So my next question is, the loan that the Scottish Government has given your company is repayable on demand. What happens if the Scottish Government come to the same conclusion as I have, that this is an unprofitable company, it is throwing m m money after bad money, and it asks for its loans to be repaid. What happens then? Be able to, to repay that loan. So what happens? The, the company would be wound up. Mm -hmm. Is this, a, Sorry, this is a technical question. The, 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 the one question I have which has confused me when I looked at the accounts, which I'm, uh, I know Mike has done, is the actual bottom line value of the assets at Presswick Airport has remained constant for five years and, and they're considerably less than the loan. Um, and that includes any money that's been used as a improvement to the fixed assets, which is a completely strange way of accounting and one which I'm not used to as a businessman to ever have seen. So you, you have a company that is valued less uh, than the money that's put into the fixed asset and nothing near the loan. Perhaps you'd like to comment on that. It might help Mike to get the answer he needs. I, I realised that question was actually asked when you, you visited, so we actually supplied a paper to the committee. I think the committee have got that in the papers. It was hopefully trying to put in layman's terms uh, in terms of the, the valuation of assets on a balance sheet uh, because it can be quite a complex area. But basically, we have two levels of assets. We've got uh, invest properties, investment properties have been held uh, for uh, rental values, etc., within the business, and that was valued by uh, Deloitte's uh, on acquisition at £2.8 million, and that gets valued each year by Deloitte's again, Deloitte's specialist uh, property section, um, and that's roughly the same value in terms of rental. Uh, but it's for accounting purposes, it's not the true value of that land in a different position. So we're bound by regulations to do that on an accounting basis. So you may have a different view depending on the future of the business as to what the value of those land assets are. They could be sold off in parcels of land, different uses. But as we as a, as a business continue to run as a business, we have to take a, abide by the accounting rules, um, but value on that basis. The second group of assets is the operational assets, which is really the terminal building, the runway, all the things we use to run the business. And again, that was valued on acquisition at a million pounds. So each year as we spend uh, on the runway and maintaining the infrastructure, we do spend that, that kind of money. But we can only capitalise that and leave that as an asset if we can show future positive cash flows. So each year, as you rightly put out, we've been making a lot, the business has made losses. So you can't you know, generate the cash out of the business. So counting rules again says you cannot leave that on the balance sheet. So you have to put it to expend it to the P&L. And these are the numbers that the committee have quoted. Because you answered my question in a way I didn't think you were going to, because I thought you would then say, well, if the government wanted to withdraw its, ask for its money back, the taxpayers' money back, that you would pursue commercial terms with other organisations to produce it. But you didn't say that. You said the business would, would go belly up, basically. It strikes me that... In no other sort of operating company would this take place. This, this, this is not a profitable company. And how long do you think the Scottish Government will be prepared to be putting in loans each year? I mean, as I say, they've put in loans to your company every year since they, they bought that one pound share. How long do you think this can continue? 
if I may, uh, Ian gave a technical answer in terms of uh, liquidity and balance sheet and uh, the issues surrounding uh, impairment. Uh, all I can say is uh, the Chair that uh, we have had approaches uh, from third parties about the business who have looked at the business in a different way and have in the past been willing uh, to, uh, to offer uh, you know, packages uh, to us and, uh, you know, in terms of acquisition, whole are apart. Now, these discussions, you know, haven't concluded in a way that we wanted them to be concluded. But one of the things that did come out was a lot of, uh, ex a lot of companies who are in our area and uh, who operate in our area have shown interest uh, round about the assets. And in terms of pure valuation of land, I don't want to say too much, but we have land which is not core to the business and uh, we know what the commercial value of that land is beyond the one million, the, the start one million, uh, 1.4 million I think it is, in the, in, the, in the accounts. And these numbers are actually significantly, significantly more. And um, uh, John, Mr. John Scott, sorry for calling you John, Mr. John Scott would know about some of these sort of uh, opportunities and what's actually going on. Mike, just before you answer, John wants to come in and then I'll come back to you and, and, and I want to bring in Peter as well. So, John, if you've got a brief question. Well, I was just to say, by way of perhaps trying to help Mike Rumbles with an answer and the understanding that I have uh, and was provided by the, the now First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, when she undertook this venture um, some five years ago, was that as I understood it, that the underlying asset value of, of Presswick Airport and the land around it is significantly more than the than the, the liabilities incurred thus far. And as I understood it at that time, since it is an arm's length bargain that the that the Scottish Government have with Presswick Airport, that they will lend in some to some extent at any rate not beyond the underlying asset value of Presswick Airport, which is an 800-acre site. Um, and so there is certainly, in the worst-case scenario, it has a huge value for building um, in, located between, um, at Pres around Presswick Airport and between Pr Troon and Air. Um, and that is, the, that is the bottom line as far as the Scottish Government is concerned, as I understand it. So in terms of Mike Rumble's question, if the business went barely up, then the Government would still get its money back in terms of the underlying asset values, as I understand it, notwithstanding the accountancy procedures which constrain um, their way of reporting the assets, as I understand it. And if I may ask a question now, or you may want me to show... To not. No, a, short question. a short question. Well, it would be that I would I'd like to ask Andrew Miller and his colleagues that given that Presswick is perhaps the best connected airport in Scotland for passengers and freight, there's motorway from central Scotland to the front door, there's 25 minutes from Newton Mairns, there's a rail link into the station, the Falklands Junction is less than a mile away and the ports of Air and Troon are within a mile. Would do you gentlemen like to talk about the potential for growth in the airport, particularly around Spaceport, around the logistics hub for Heathrow, and around the development of MRO for companies such as Chevron and others, Spirit, GE? John, and, and, and very rudely, I'm going to say, and, and I'm going to stop you at that particular question, because uh, as a... Uh, invite it or uh, somebody who's joined the committee you don't get the committee papers and those specific questions are coming up I see, so I, I, fe I fear you you may get your answers you may have to wait for them uh, but thank you for the comment I'll come back to Mike and then I want to go to Peter so Mike um, thank you convener so now it becomes crystal clear to me now that the value of this company is not in its operations but in the value of the land in which the airport sits that's what's being said um, that is just what's been said. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Specific on a technical issue that was raised about why does the balance sheet only show 3.8 million uh, when you could potentially have a much larger value for 
the land that the, the, the airport operates under. Uh, and we were trying to demonstrate that that's a, that was a significantly higher number uh, if you went down to market and, and sold the land. But that's not our purpose. The county purpose is we have to look at as a business going forward and put that to the side. But there's the underlying value of the business is dependent on what someone thinks of that operation. And as I think Andrew has already hi highlighted, that there has been significant interest uh, in, a, in, in, the, in the airport in developing that with opportunities. No change. In the four years before the Scottish Government bought the company, you made an operating loss of £25 million. And in the four years since the Scottish Government took over the company, you've made a similar loss. So you are making losses every year, and you've made losses every year for the last nine years. And nothing I've heard today gives me any confidence that um, you are turning a corner or that you are about to increase your, well, you're not... You, profitability. Um, so re really, uh, the, my, my question is, how, I'd like to know how much is the value of the land that John Scott has, the point that John Scott has just been making, how, how, how valuable is the land on which the airport sits? Again, that's a subjective question uh, and it depends on the market conditions. If the airport wasn't running as an, as an airport and it wasn't there, it depends what use you have for that, whether it's for housing, commercial, as different valuations. So I can't give you, uh, as an expert, a uh, question. I mean that this is not a, 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 a profitable operating company that should be invested in, but there we are. Maybe, maybe as part of the valuation, I'm sure as a result of this, you will be looking at uh, the value of, of the assets held by the company as part of your... Uh, due diligence. Uh, part, part of a review process for this year in terms of options, in terms of what we do, the use of the airport uh, is, is one of those considerations. Correct. Thank you. And we look forward to hopefully seeing that at some stage. Peter, you have a question before we move on to the next question after that. Yeah, I mean, we've heard today that you've had very modest growth in passenger and freight. It is very modest. Um, and we all know that you, 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 need, you often need to invest to grow any business. Now, do you feel that you have access to sufficient capital to make the necessary investments so that you can grow this business? Bear in mind that it's not just about growing the business. As I also understand that within the next five years, the, the primary radar system will need to be replaced. Uh, do you know how much that will cost? And have you had any ideas how you will fund that if... if uh, if that has to happen within the next five years. So it's about growing the business, but it's also about the infrastructure, the, the major infrastructure cost of the, the radar as well. I think it's very, very clear to me that the business had suffered from uh, lack of funding in terms of the infrastructure for many, many years, long before the Scottish Government got involved in the business. And uh, to be fair to the Scottish Government, there's been a willingness there to bring the facility up to as good a standard as we can expect that will not put off operators. And again, I, I made the earlier comment, as far as I'm concerned, as, as an airline man, nothing about the facility puts me off. In fact, our customers love us. I've met a lot of the customers at the airport. They all think it's a fantastic facility. So we don't have a problem with the facility as such. Uh, we routinely, every year as part of the, the loan, probably three, four million pounds of that goes on the actual infrastructure with a 3,000 metre runway, we, over a 10-year period, resurface uh, 300 metres each year. So it's a bit like the fourth road bridge, uh, over a 10-year period, and you start again, because that's the best way of keeping the airport open. But, yeah, that, that 300 metre stretch could, it'll be a seven-figure sum of money just to keep the runway in a serviceable condition. So there are, like any businesses, opportunities to spend more money, money and improve the infrastructure. But there's no, there's, there's no problem at the moment. Everything we need to operate, we have got in place. In terms of the, the primary radar, uh, I don't know how much has been said at previous committee meetings, but there is uh, a, a brand new radar being installed as we speak, which will be operational probably, I think, by December. And that that has been funded, like many others of these projects in, in the UK, by the wind farm developers. Okay, that's, that's, that's ongoing and will be up and running it's, shortly. It, if you came to the site, you would actually see it there. It's there, but mm. it doesn't actually operate at the moment. We go through various testing and all the rest of it. But it's, 
the very latest standard that can identify wind farm activity, for instance, and it's, uh, it'll be up and running by the end of the year. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jamie, yours is the next question. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I think one of the things we haven't really spoken about today, and it's an important point, is that Presswick is also, also about people. Presswick em employs a lot of di direct and indirect people, and, and I, perhaps one of the, I wasn't in this parliament at the time, but perhaps one of the original reasons for <coughs> safeguarding the site was the fact that it was a huge part of the local economy. Uh, and I think it was right that members supported that at the time. Uh, and Presswick has always had a very uh, emotional uh, reaction from the public. It's a very nostalgic piece of, of uh, our aviation history in Scotland. But we are where we are at the moment. And given that you're at 90% occupancy on your pro property portfolio, you have a single retail passenger airline who is notorious at moving from airports at a whim. <laughs> Uh, and given that you've had 17 meetings with cargo companies over the last 12 months, but no real growth in that side of the business either, my question really is, from a strategic point of view, are we getting to crunch time after five or six years of public funding? It, it, is it your view as a panel that you're getting to the point where you're crunching the numbers and you will be making strong uh, strategic recommendations on what the next steps are for the airport? Uh, we are re-crunching the numbers. Uh, some of the, uh, the major projects in terms of growth, in terms of Heathrow, and the UK Space Agency's decision on Spaceport have been delayed. And I, I can sit here and comment on the reasons why they've been delayed, but we've got to be big people and understand that. Uh, they're still coming down by way of the you know, longer term, medium term horizon. You are absolutely right that there have been significant changes. And in our five-year plan, we, the business managed to achieve the financial performance in year one and year two. And year three, we're struggling a little bit because of the Brexit-related issues, uh, because of the other activity that we plan to be adding to the business by way of spaceport, uh, by way of new carriers. And we have to revise uh, the, the five-year plan on a changing set of assumptions, which the business is currently doing just now. And we will have a, a solution and a way forward uh, before the end of this year. So we had a strategic vision announced in 2014 that focused on passengers, freight, revenues and operating costs. Then there was a strategic plan announced April last year. We're now 14 months into that plan. Uh, is it going well? Are you meeting the objectives in that plan that was announced last year? And, or, 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 is it, or as you're saying, are you announcing a new plan that's coming out at the end of this year? So I'm a bit confused as to that so many different directions, visions, pl plans, strategies. Uh, you know, I guess going back to my original question is, you know, at what point do you take overarching responsibility for this and say, this is where the airport needs to go. This is the, the only direction we think it should go. Okay, let's not confuse you. Let's be very clear and very blunt. In any business with a five-year plan, uh, usually the, the uh, short-term years are more crystal clear in terms of the base, the current year. As you go forward, some of the variables change. It's a mature board, a mature management team that recognize these changes and adjust the assumptions and the numbers on a regular ongoing basis, which the business, the business does, not just in terms of the five-year plan, but in terms of the, uh, the current year. And in the current year, we hadn't, in some respects, achieved some of the volume growth and revenue that we expected, but the management team, Stuart especially, and Ian, the management team have accepted that, but they've squeezed enough juice out of the lemon in terms of efficiencies, a recalibration of the mix in business. You know, fuel, for instance, has doubled uh, this year compared to last year in terms of the mix of the business. That was a significant achievement for the management team to try and address the bottom line to achieve uh, the bottom line that we had in the plan. Changes mix, change in margin to try and achieve that. And, uh, you know, the project's called Project Rebalance, and Stuart and his management team have done a significant job. We're big people. We understand that foreign exchange rates change, the price of fuel changes. Uh, people, you know, for instance, we lost two of the largest uh, carriers in Europe, uh, Air Berlin and Alitalia, in the last 12 months. 
and the opportunities presented by these markets, like in Germany, for instance, significant uh, opportunities for some of the carriers like Ryanair and EasyJet. And because of Brexit, which causes a lot of uh, risk attributes in terms of the aviation industry, we have to recalibrate uh, in terms of the assumptions. We have to recalibrate the numbers. It's part of day-to-day -day ongoing business. What's your gut feeling, though? I mean, you're, you're respected aviation experts in, on this panel, and you're, you're leading the, the charge here at Presswick. You, you must have a gut feeling as to where things are heading, where the future direction of the airport is. I'd be really p pleased to hear it if you have. Board and management don't rely on gut. We rely on facts, we rely on strategy, we rely on macroeconomic variables, which we try to manage in the most positive way that we can. There's one thing I would add to that. I think the reality is the whole aviation industry, if you look at the forecast going forward, the whole curve just increases. So demand for air travel will yeah, be huge over the next few years. This country does not build new airports. So at the moment, yeah, we're fairly unique. We've got a 3,000 metre runway, which gives us amazing capability. It's not only long, but it's wide. So over a period of time, you know, the country will not build new airports. Airport capacities, yeah, will be will be challenged. And I think, yeah, its future as a, as an airport might not be yeah rosy right now, but in the future, it's inevitable that we'll get a far busier airport. Next question is from Kate Forbes. Thank you very much. You have uh, touched on this already. You mentioned that there have been a number of approaches expressing an interest in buying Presto Airport or investing in the business. Now, you probably have touched on this already, but are you able to provide any more detail about those approaches or what those approaches might look like in the future? Well, we have had approaches. Some of these approaches are governed by non-disclosure agreements. Uh, that we have from various parties. Uh, we have a criteria, a checklist against uh, the interested parties. And it is true probably that 90% of them are ruled out uh, when you ask them uh, things like experience of running an airport, uh, can you bring in incremental uh, revenue to the top line? And some of these parties, for instance, you know, own airports. Uh, the, uh, they operate well, airports and airlines. And um, so it's a very narrow chevron as we've gone through time. We, we have had approaches in the last sort of six months. Um, it's true to say some of them are tar kickers. Uh, so experience of running airports and airlines, having the access to capital to fund the business going forward, understand the dynamics of the market in terms of how they might be able to fix the top line. We've had uh, discussions with people on cargo airlines. We've had uh, discussions with uh, foreign parties that uh, deal with passenger airlines. But having the capital and the access to capital at the correct and proper uh, uh, cost uh, is very important. So we have criteria that we go through. But it is true in the last sort of 12 to 18 months, there's probably only been one or two parties that fit the criteria. And it's our commercial criteria. You know, we don't want to sell the business currently to somebody who wants to close down the runway and build houses. And it's all, it's been initiated by third parties. It's not been actively looking for a buyer. Well, the position is, sorry, too quick. <laughs> the position is the business is not actively up for sale. But if come, somebody comes along that shares the same strategic vision of the board, we will talk to them. If they have the capital funding, we will talk to them. If they have the expertise, we will talk to them. And uh, these people know who we are, and there's been robust discussions with uh, a number of parties uh, over the last uh, two or three years, which has been part and parcel of our strategic objectives. One of the three years, we return the business to the private sector in whole or part, but do it in a long-term, sustainable way. No fire sales. No jumping into uh, joint ventures with companies that uh, you know, don't have any experience in this area. So it's a very narrow chevron. But we do know, because of our experience, we know who these parties are, and we know where they live, and we know what the growth profiles are. And uh, you know, we talk to them regularly in dialogue about the future of our business and how they can help. OK. Um, I think, Mike, you want to ask a specific response. You said the airport wasn't actively up for sale, just simply... Is it for sale? 
Sorry. I work yes. in the commercial world. You know, everything's up for sale. Oh. Okay. Right, I think we're going to leave that there. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Kate. Uh, John, you may be about to get your answers, but Colin's going to ask the question. Okay, I mean, there, there, is, um, there is obviously a lot of nostalgia towards Presswick Airport. It was a wonderful documentary last night about the 1978 World Cup uh, and the team flying out from Presswick to, to Argentina. Well, sadly, Scotland team's flying at the World Cup. It's probably not a good, profitable opportunity for you in the, the very near future. <laughs> but um, one, area, one area of growth that there will be um, that is currently very topical, of course, is the potential third runway at um, Heathrow Airport and the prospect of, um, of a hub um, coming to, to, to Presswick. So can I ask specifically what discussions you've had with Heathrow and the government to, to make that happen and, and what are the opportunities from that? Definitely going to come to you if I could ask you to be as concise as possible in relation to this. Okay, yep. we are one of 10 Scottish competing bids. Uh, the Heathrow people have been up, and I mean by people including the CEO, have been up, uh, well CEO once, the other members of the team I uh, have been for the third time, and that third time was last week, where we put our best foot forward uh, with a local stakeholder group, the ports, the rail, uh, uh, our business, and some of the interested parties who've added, uh, you know, uh, uh, added grease to the quicker turning of the wheels, including our dear friends in South Ayrshire Council. And uh, they were up last week, and the meeting was very positive. Uh, exceptionally positive, and uh, they are working with us. The minister, as you know, um, Mr. Keith Brown, signed an MOU which clarified uh, Scotland's role in that supply chain, and uh, they were working to that MOU. So it's looking very positive at the moment. What would that mean from a business point of view to to Presswick? Presswick, or in terms of the. The whole, the whole picture for the Scottish economy. The, the, the whole picture, but specifically press it if you were to secure that. Well, okay. I, I, one supply hub, or there might be two or three. Uh, we don't know. That is up to, to Heathrow. In terms of uh, the whole picture for the Scottish economy, it's 5,000 jobs uh, over a period of about uh, 10 years. So it's quite significant. What we don't know from the supply chain, sorry, Mr. Chair, I'll try and be quick. From the supply chain, Heathrow don't want to tip their hand in terms of procurement prior to identifying where the hubs are because they want the best possible prices out of the Scottish manufacturing base. And to tip their hand in terms of where the hubs are going to be, who the suppliers are going to be, would put them in a prime position to increase their margins. So quite rightly, they, they are not uh, keen to disclose that just now. But the meeting was very positive. And it's a significant amount of money. But it's from the supplier base, we're just consolidating and transshipping uh, the uh, semi-fabricated pieces down to, down to Heathrow. They need 15,000 people in Heathrow. They can't get 15,000 people on the site, so uh, there are 5,000 uh, people out of these 15 that are going to come from, come from Scotland, be based in Scotland. And part of the discussions have been on uh, our offices, uh, the number of employees that they would actually put into Presswick and the facilities we have, etc. Very, very good. Maya, who's the procurement director on the project, uh, I spent two hours with last week, and, and Stuart, uh, during the time that we're at, uh, in the facility. Uh, John, I think you wanted to come in on that. Um, yeah, Mr Miller, that, that's a remarkably round figure, that 5,000. Have you got a breakdown of how that would be made up, please? Breakdown depends on where the supplier base are, is in the Scottish uh, production uh, cycle, right? That 5,000 depends on, for instance, people are building lifts, are they coming from Scotland, are they coming from other parts of the UK? But in generality, that's in the presentation uh, from the, the, Heathrow, the Heathrow team, and it's in the public domain. Forgive me, I don't understand that. Um, you said 5,000 jobs in Scotland. Yes. Can you break down whether... Because if there are jobs in Scotland... Not, 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 not in front of me just now, but that's the commitment that uh, the Heathrow people have made to the Scottish Government. And access to Heathrow slots as part and parcel of that development. Um, sorry, just to have... John, would it, uh, Andrew, if you have those figures that you could lay out on, on, on something to the committee, would, I think if you don't have them to hand, would be helpful. I will. Uh, I just have to check John, the confiden confidentiality of the breakdown. Well, Sorry, well if I may come back yet yeah, on the issue of confidentiality, because an awful lot of this seems to be around headlines and inducements. 
I don't know if I'm allowed to use the word inducements, but I mean, very, very clearly, very, very clearly, um, people can be seduced by a figure like the creation of 5,000 jobs. So there should be clarity around that before that figure's been bandied about, either by the Scottish Government or any of its agencies. So any information that you could provide uh, um, to give some clarity to that headline figure, which is a very impressive headline figure, I don't doubt, and who doesn't want jobs created? That would be very helpful, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. Uh, Stuart, briefly. Uh, it was just to say, I, I, I think given that Presswick is one of ten options for those 5,000 jobs, that really that's a question for the Scottish Government that we might properly address to them. R Richard, do you want to come in yeah, very, br I, very <coughs> briefly, Richard, please? I know a small bit about this, but I, I, you know, at the end of the day, it's not... not it, it's not Presswick. You know, Stuart's right. It's, it's a commitment that's been given to the Scottish Government by Heathrow, that, that there will be a hub, a hub, a hub in Scotland. So it's no, it's no uh, for, with the greatest respect, Andrew Miller to give that information to us. It's the Scottish Government to give that information. I think if Andrew's happy to give it to us, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to take it from the, from the committee's point of view. But if, if you're not in a position to give it to us, I would understand that. John, do you want to come back very briefly? Well, I'm sure Mr Miller will forgive me if I've picked that up wrong, but the reason I focus on the word 5,000 jobs is because I thought that was what Mr Miller was saying, that the potential of winning this hub was 5,000 jobs, and so it was simply to ask for a breakdown. But, and are you able to say who the other, uh, who, who your opposition is in Scotland, Mr uh, Miller? Well, we're all Team Scotland and part of Team Scotland. There are nine other sites that have been identified. Uh, what in my area? would be helpful as okay. well. Thank you, Mr. Mark. Um, we're now going to come to uh, the final of John's questions to come from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, we've touched on it a number of times um, in various questions. I want to talk about the application to become a spaceport. And you mentioned that the decision by the UK Space Agency had been delayed. Have you been given a reason for that? And do you know when that decision may be forthcoming? Andrew. It's been delayed around uh, 12 months. Um, part and parcel of the delay, I believe, uh, is the complexity of the, uh, of the operators and the airports that are involved. Part and parcel of that delay, and I'm trying to be as uh, politically as sensitive as possible, part of the delay is to do with Brexit and the allocation of resources to the decision makers down in Westminster. We're very well dialed in both to the House of Lords and the House of Commons in terms of the select committees and both in terms of the process. Uh, and uh, that has caused some delays. But the, the technical issues uh, surrounding the operators and the opportunity, the opportunity is phenomenal, but the technical issues, for instance, uh, we, we applied with five uh, operators, space satellite lunch operators. And uh, the UK Space Agency had a technical panel who went through the five operators, tested the P&L balance sheet technology, far beyond my personal uh, intellectual capacity, and chose two operators to continue with Presswick. So there's been, there's been uh, sessions, as it were, in terms of uh, uh, phases. And uh, we're at the last phase with two nominated operators, which I can't uh, disclose today. And uh, we work with these operators. Um, and uh, to uh, prepare and finalise uh, the numbers. So uh, that's one issue. The other issue is the regulatory envi environment around the licensing for spaceport in terms of the technical issues in terms of storage of fuel, etc. And uh, we uh, looked at the US FAA rules for spaceports and Presswick's about 90% compliant as an average. Uh, but we don't have the rules from the Civil Aviation Authority as yet. We're doing it with the, the DTI in terms of fixing the compliance environment around spaceport operations in the UK. But we're only one of two uh, horizontal launch uh, applications still left in the running. Uh, there was about six or seven. Uh, but there's a vertical launch component to this as well, uh, which uh, there's a lot of different points in Scotland who are part and parcel of that, which a lot of members around this table will know about, but I clearly don't, uh, in terms of how the market's bifurcating and the development. When I started this project, getting your satellites into space from Kazakhstan cost 30 million US dollars, because of Elon Musk, he's actually predicting 
So he says a launch cost of seven million US dollars from his SpaceX project. So there's been a phenomenal change in the costs of launching, because satellite vertical launches were very expensive, but now they're reducing in cost. And I think the UK Space Agency, to be fair to them, is a very complex area, and they haven't hit uh, the deadlines. And uh, we were supposedly told, supposedly told, uh, by Jake, who heads up the agency, that we should know about the Farnborough Air Show. But it's a political process, and uh, you know, I just watch with interest. A brief well, follow-up with, with hopefully a brief answer. Yeah. That, well, as we know, the air show is not too far in the distant future, so we'll await that with interest. Can you tell us maybe some of the benefits that it would bring to both the airport and the area as a whole? That's a very good question. Within our boundary fence, obviously the commercialisation of the land, the monetization of the land and the value of the land is more and more manufacturers and people who support that industry want to take up space. We have the space. It's a great key opportunity for us, 885 acres. So there's manufacturers and industries and enterprises that are associated with that. We'll get the loading and landing fees, uh, the fuel uh, fees uh, surrounding that, and we're fully compliant in that sort of area. The bigger issue in terms of the economic benefit for the UK, including the Scottish economy, is the manufacturing of these satellites, where the people are, the supply chain, and we know who they are, we work with them, we understand the demand requirements, and they would be more than happy to come and sit in our uh, airport enterprise, uh, rather than uh, you know a three-week trip to Kazakhstan where they have to piggyback the loads on military loads, et cetera, et cetera, and sometimes you know, they wait three months for a launch. So there's great supplier uh, satellite manufacturing demand uh, in, our own, in our own backyard. And uh, the expectation of job creation? Um, I think the figure for, for, for an GVA, and that's not my, this isn't my figure, I can even give you the, the date, it was two, 2017, uh, and the company who did it, it was 1.4 billion. Right. No, one a GVA, a GVA. <laughs> not I, jobs. I'm pushing you on jobs. I'm nervous, I'm nervous in jobs. I can't, can you remember <laughs> I, what the I number know you was? Dodged I've it. got it in my briefing pack. I've got it in my briefing pack. Oh, here we are. 4,617 jobs. No, <laughs> and, and on that note, that is probably a appropriate point to end it. I'd like to thank Andrew and Stuart for coming in again, and thank Ian after eight weeks for taking a baptism of fire at the committee. Um, I think it wasn't actually a baptism of fire. Th thank you for the information. There are some bits that we're, we're going to follow up post that, um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll be keeping an eye on this uh, as as this session. Um, continues. So thank you very much and I'm briefly suspending the meeting to allow the witnesses to depart. I would ask committee members no more than five minutes please. I suspend the meeting.
Okay. Uh, we're now going to reconvene the item, uh, the agenda, sorry, the committee. And we're going to move on to agenda item five, which is the consideration of subordinate legislation. Before I do so, I'd like to ask if there are any members that would like to declare an interest. And I will declare an interest that I have a uh, interest in a farming partnership. Uh, Peter. To declare an interest in a farming partnership also. Stuart. I have a small registered agricultural holding. Okay. Agenda item five is the consideration of one instrument that is not subject to any parliamentary procedure. The instrument relates to TB control measures for bovine animals. This is a no procedure instrument which the committee would not originally be... Uh, sorry, ordinarily be required to consider. However, the committee was advised that both the NFUS and the Scottish Beef Association had concerns about certain policy intentions of the instrument. NFUS also raised with the committee some concerns that their submission to the Scottish Government on the SSI appeared not to have been taken into account. The Scottish Government only this morning wrote to the committee acknowledging the technical issues had led to two submissions, that was the NFUS and indeed the BVA, not being received. And these, therefore, had not been taken into account. So considering the information we had before, that means there were three uh, submissions that weren't being taken into account. The Scottish Government has, therefore, in the circumstances, decided to revoke the instrument consider the policy issues raised by the NFUS and the other submissions that had not been considered and to lay a new order at a later date. I just wondered if anyone in the committee has any comments to make. Stuart. Um, uh, thank you, Convener. It's disappointing that this has happened, although I think the correct response is the one the government's taken to withdraw the order. But I, I think it's important to... Uh, open the question as to whether in uh, failing to recognise it had received these three uh, submissions from quite important stakeholders in relation to this order, uh, whether there is a wider systemic problem that might affect other policy areas uh, across government. And I think we should make sure that we communicate with the government uh, the need for them to assure us or appropriately to fix any uh, systemic problems there may be so that we don't and ever committees don't find themselves in a similar position in future. Okay, Stuart, thank you. Peter. Yes, thanks, convener. I mean, I accept that the, the mistakes have been made and it's important that, the, that all people have a chance to comment on these, these uh, documents and, and I, I agree that this is the right procedure to withdraw it at this point in time. But I would like to, st to state that it, I would hope that this comes forward in, in, in the very near future because this is about protecting our very precious TB clear status in Scotland. This is about tightening up the rules and, and the, some of the, the compensation around that uh, TB status and I would love to see this come forward as soon as possible because I think it's very important that we do um, tighten up procedures and uh, make sure that we protect our TB free status. Thank you, um, Peter. Uh, Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Just uh, for the record, from a process point of view, uh, I would uh, strongly urge the Scottish Government to ensure that its uh, consultation process is as robust as possible. The feedback from NFUS and indeed the Scottish Beef Association uh, was that they felt that their submissions had not been taken into account through that process and there may be other third parties or stakeholders whose views were not taken into account. And it's just a friendly uh, appeal to uh, the directorate involved uh, to uh, ensure that consultation processes in such important matters are uh, inclusive, uh, uh, transparent and as robust as possible. Thank you. Uh, Mike. Yeah. Yes, reference to the letter that you received this morning and then we have a copy of during <coughs> the 20th of June. And it says, accordingly, uh, this is from a civil servant, Accordingly, I can confirm that at the earliest opportunity, we will bring forward a further instrument to revoke the Tuberculosis Scotland order. The Scottish Government will seek to introduce a new order, etc. Um, while that might be the case, it should really, in my view, um, 
form has it that this should have been um, a letter from the government, from from the minister, from the cabinet secretary responsible. I'm surprised that it wasn't sent to us in there. The effect is the same, but I think it's important that we write to the minister about this and not to the civil servants. John. Thank you. The two points that I'd hoped to make have been covered, and that is one about the process to make sure that this is maybe just a blip for this instance, and to pick up on Mr Chapman's comment about the TB free status, which I think is important and should give a sense of urgency. I just wouldn't want it to be thought that um, there is any committee endorsement to the position of uh, either of these, any of these submissions, because certainly when the Scottish Beef um, Association's position is that there should be no limit on compensation, that's not something that I would be prepared to agree to. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Yeah. I'm taking on board the points that have been made, but from, from me reading this letter, I take it that the clerk of our committee, Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, uh, was in contact with the Agricultural and Rural Economy Directorate, who uh, is uh, Sheila Vos, Chief Veterinary Officer for Scotland, and she's replied to it based on the fact that. But again, I take cognizance that uh, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will look at this situation and resolve it. Does anyone else uh, have a comment? I, th I think that uh, what's, what's coming out of this quite clearly is that the very fact that the committee has looked at this has identified that there are a few problems and the government has responded entirely correctly by revoking uh, the instrument and then are going to relay it. I take John's point entirely. It is not up to the committee to endorse any of the comments made in the submissions that have been left off, but it should be for the committee to say that those submissions should be considered. And I think as a committee we have a right, as Stuart has indicated, to uh, find out why those people have been admitted. And, and technically they are probably three of the bigger stakeholders in relation to this. And I think it's important that we make sure that uh, that's not missed. And I'm sure that uh, people with uh, individual comments in relating uh, to the instrument will get a chance now to feed into the government that... Uh, that uh, their views. I, I also take on point that, from Peter's point of view, that this Scotland has been TB free since 2009, uh, and the fact that John Finney has made is that we don't want to allow TB in, and it's important that whatever we do doesn't do that. So, bearing all that in mind, uh, may I suggest that the uh, committee writes to the Cabinet Secretary and notes our concern that these. Uh, well, first of all, welcomes the action that the government is taking, notes our concerns regarding to how these uh, consultations were missed off, and uh, writes also in that letter um, to the Cabinet Secretary asking it to him to explain to the committee why they were left off and ask him to re re or sorry, introduce a revised SSI as soon as possible to protect Scotland's status. I, I actually think that this has proved just how valuable committees are and, and the work that's being done to make sure the legislation uh, is being scrutinised. So with the committee's approval, that is what I propose to do subsequent to this meeting. I, I assume that is what the committee is happy for me to do. Thank you. Um, we are now going to move on to... Agenda item six, which is subordinate legislation, uh, which relates to uh, negative instruments. One is the marketing of fruit, uh, animal byproducts, and pet passport fees, animal health fees, and beef and pig uh, carcass scheme. I would ask the committee to note that no motions to null have been received in relation to these instruments. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any re recommendations in relation to these instruments? Yes, sorry. Comment, um, Stuart. I'd, I'd just like to put on the record a comment in relation to SSI 2018-177, animal health, miscellaneous fees, etc. Um, just looking at the fee structure, I think there are a number of things which I, I, I find are quite welcome. Um, there's quite a lot of fee reductions and there are some fee increases. Just to choose out a very large portfolio, an example of, of a good fee reduction, approval of the first year of a scheme member's flock or hatchery or combined flock or hatchery on one site where the 
inspection is carried out by a veterinary officer. That is coming down from £233 to £27. And obviously that is the kind of thing which reduces the barriers to entry. Um, and, and there are other similar reductions. So I think, I think it's a very complex order, I accept, and I'm cherry-picking, but I think uh, it's quite interesting and I very much welcome the order and some of the things that I see in it. I, I have to say, having read them all, it, it's quite complex in the set that for pet passport fees, there isn't a set price for it and there is a reduction in the price of the uh, documents that are being, sorry, a slight increase in the price of the documents being received, but it doesn't reflect on how much that will affect on the passport. So there's a lot of unknowns in there, which I'm sure we've all picked up on. But, but I don't think, I mean, I think we can note those comments. I don't think it's up to making a recommendation. Um, so can I, having heard Stuart's comment, ask again, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to any of these instruments? That's agreed. The committee will now move into private session. Thank you.